Hi, I'm Bob Parker, Mayor of Christchurch City. And since September the 4th, 2010, our region has experienced over 9,500 earthquakes. Tragically, the February 22nd quake claimed almost 200 lives. And just, thought, uh, just when we thought the quakes had eased, on the 23rd of December, we got another reminder that nature is very much in charge here still. Now, while some of the quakes that we've faced have been nothing more than a gentle rumble, hundreds of them have been very violent, terrifying experiences that have frazzled our nerves and caused us many sleepless nights. And I'm really proud to say uh, that we're standing up to this as a community in a remarkable way, and our recovery is well underway. Our people are really enthusiastic about the future, but we all want to know what is actually going on beneath us, and when will this ever end? Well, to discuss the science of it all today, I have with me Kelvin Berryman of GNS and Jarg Pettinger of Canterbury uh, University. So, gentlemen, uh, welcome along. First question for you is, on the basis of all the uh, scientific work that uh, you and others have been carrying out in recent works, what have you learned about the fault that triggered that event on the 23rd of December? Uh, shall I take that? I, I think um, we really need to go back to sort of April, May last year when we started to uh, run some seismic surveys to investigate um, the existence of faults beneath the Canterbury Plains gravels and also offshore in the subsurface. And it has to be realised that a lot of these faults actually don't have any surface expression. They've been covered by this uh, gravel expression. deposition. You mean there's nothing you no, can see on the Nothing on the ground surface right. at all. They're all buried beneath the surface. And uh, so we've, we've had to investigate with uh, other methodologies to get at them. Um, so the seismic reflection surveys we did back in April and May revealed a number of faults beneath the subsurface, both uh, directly beneath the city and also to the west and southwest of the city. And there was an extensive marine survey done by NIWA at the time, and that revealed uh, a number of new faults that we hadn't been aware of before, plus it provided further details on other structures we had previously mapped. Now, when the, these earthquakes happened in December on, on the uh, 23rd and, and subsequently, of course, we've had a sequence of aftershocks, um, the, there are other ways that we can understand what is happening beneath the subsurface. And one of the, the ways is uh, using satellite data and looking at the distortions of the landscape, if you like. We've got uh, information coming in from the, the satellite radar surveys that give us an idea of how the ground has been changed, distorted from before to after the earthquake. Uh, we have GPS, uh, global positioning stations, high precision stations, which allow us also to look at surface displacements. And these can be related to what's happening at depths of kilometres beneath the surface, even though there isn't a fault right up to the ground surface. You can actually work out what is happening deeper down. And then, uh, most importantly, we can also record with fairly good accuracy the location of these earthquakes, where they're actually occurring, and if they relate to some of these larger faults that we've, um, we've got down there, uh, we can start to see the uh, alignment, if you like, of these aftershocks on those faults, and, uh, and we can interpret that along with the satellite data, along with the GPS data, along with the seismic reflection data. And this gives us a pretty good idea about what is going on down there, even though we can't get in there to have a look at it directly. So one question that, that bothers many of us, are all of these different earthquakes in some way interconnected are they, or are they completely um, separate events? Mm. I think they're interconnected for sure. Um, once the Darfield earthquake occurred back on the 4th of September, then that's um, set up a a bit of a chain reaction, I suppose, around the region, and, and, and one is, is influencing, whether it's a direct, direct trigger, it's hard to say, but certainly influencing what goes on in, in the area. So we've noted this, noticed this, uh, well, everybody's noticed a fairly consistent eastward shift of where the larger earthquakes have been occurring, a little bit southwards as well with the June event, but moving um, eastward, unfortunately February the 22nd was essentially right in the city, but since then it's a little bit further to the east. So uh, while we know a lot about the earthquakes after they've happened, knowing where the next one is going to happen, that's always the big challenge. So you can, using this very high-tech equipment, essentially begin to map out 
what is the, 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 the shattered structure, I suppose? What's the faulted structure mm. of the rock beneath the city? And as each event comes along, you're able to see how that's connected in some way to previous events. Mm. Does that give you the ability then to be able to go, well, we can see where it's been and perhaps we can now see where it's going to? Is there any indication mm. that you get around that? I guess some indications, mm. but not really a really precise or a, a, a overly confident assessment in the fact that we could see pretty confidently where future, really bigger earthquakes could be, but not the magnitude sixes. They're occurring down in the very broken up bedrock under the region, mm. and there's many, many old structures down there that are being um, reactivated. They're not really big, but they're big enough to sustain a magnitude six. Okay, so that was really going to be leading into my next question, I think. You know, what are, that they're down there, but what's the likelihood of, of these uh, faults that you're seeing Mm. And, and understanding causing uh, another cluster of quakes, for example, the, like the ones that began again on the 23rd of December? Um, very difficult, very difficult question. Sooner or later, this, um, the, the, the effects that have been created because of the 4th of September earthquake will fade away. There's a thought that, you know, that, that it influences an area that may be 50 or 60 kilometres around that fault line. Um, and we can count the number of earthquakes that are occurring and that's starting to behave in a cumulative sort of way in a reasonable fashion. So it's starting to, rather than being very strange and anomalous and whatever, overall the whole sequence now is looking uh, reasonably normal in terms of the expected number of events. Um, but knowing where the next ones are going to be in a really forecast, accurate forecast way, exactly where and when is really, really, that's impossible. A tendency or a probability or some numbers about the general likelihood of certain sized earthquakes is much more tractable. One of the positive moments for me in the recent briefing that you uh, gave the media in Christchurch was when you produced a graph and for the first time you were able to say, and this perhaps reinforces the point that you're making, that there'd been some talk about lost energy Mm -hmm. after the September the 4th quake mm -hmm. and it's released a lot of energy. We haven't seen all of this expressed yet. Mm -hmm. And for the first time you showed us a graph mm -hmm. that said, you know, all of that energy is now essentially uh, mm -hmm. been able to be identified. And, mm -hmm. and I think that's a positive. Yeah, it is a positive. Within some uncertainty, of course, these are, these are sort of mathematical calculations of what is normal and what is average. Um, it's been a really interesting part interesting part of the earthquake sequence is that there's a lot of energy a lot of earthquakes soon after the bigger event mm. but then it drops away quite quickly and that dropping away really quickly is actually a little bit of the anomalous stuff so not actually the the events themselves but actually how quickly it goes quiet mm. and so in a lot of ways post um, September there's a lot of earthquakes quite soon after but within a few weeks it was getting to be quite quiet and I do recall people saying they would rather have, still have a few more earthquakes because you actually know what's going on than having a big quiet time because big quiet time you really don't know. Now with hindsight with 15 months or more of, of actual data we can plot the, the, uh, the, the number of total earthquakes and it's starting to look like when you take the whole of the whole sequence, then it starts to look a little bit normal, and we're coming up to the expected number of earthquakes post a big earthquake like the 7.1. Oh, well, that, that, that is some positive so news it's, for it's, us, yeah. Calvin. I, I wonder if I can go on to another area now, because we've been talking about how the faults and the activity seem to have moved out to the east, mm -hmm. under the sea, mm -hmm. and people, of course, will remember that after the 22nd of February, in 2010 there was an horrendous event in Japan mm -hmm. with a massive tsunami. Mm -hmm. Is that something that we need to be concerned about here in terms of these faults that we're now identifying creating an event like that? Not like Japan, not like Sumatra, not like you can get in around the other parts of the Pacific margin. In terms of local earthquakes, the they're the wrong sort of earthquake, they pre the movement directions don't produce big seafloor displacements and they're happening in quite shallow water. So all of those things count against the, the, the 
likelihood that even a magnitude 7 offshore would produce a, a significantly or a really dangerous tsunami. That's not to say that there won't be a tsunami, but it will be small and there still needs to be some preparation and some, um, um, some, some good um, response actions. Yes. Well, so we need to be planning for the potential for what could be a 1.5 yeah. um, metre right. wave, potentially, right. but this area to sum it up, isn't capable of producing the sort of wave that we saw in uh, Japan no, that's going to sweep across the city. which was 20 and more metres, so okay. uh, definitely not mm. anything of that range. We, the, um, the Canterbury region is, is most exposed to large earthquakes in South America producing tsunami that travel all the way across the Pacific with about 12 hours mm. warning time. They okay. will be bigger than the local ones, and of course those can be well planned for, there's enough time to do some good analysis of the of the wave as it is coming across the Pacific, and enough time for the emergency management um, teams to give right. good warnings. Well, I mean that's again, I find that quite a, a reassuring yeah. conversation, and it's certainly one that I've had with our civil defence right. people a number and we've of been times over the years. We've been practicing those yep. recently with other Japan earthquakes yep. or from the Kumadex um, recently, and I think those um, those tsunami warning. Um, and activities that have been pretty successful. So uh, another, another issue I, I think that people need a little bit more clarity around is we're going to have heightened seismic activity, uh, I think you've been saying, for, for maybe another 20 or um, 30 years. I mean, what does that actually mean for mm. us, mm. us folks yeah, what I'll, lives I'll, here? I'll take that one. Um, the, the way that we think about this is, is that the rocks in the subsurface have a certain strength associated with them. And when we have a large earthquake, there's a distortion. And that distortion of the rock mass was expressed after the Darfield um, earthquake and the Greendale Fault rupture as a displacement of several metres at the surface. And of course that extends on right through the upper crust. And so those rocks, all in that volume around the fault line, have been stressed and changed. And that stress takes some time to start to dissipate and be relieved. Um, looking at it from the point of view of the strength of the rocks and, and uh, the, the science team at GNS have been looking at how um, extensive the area of distortion is, it's approximately twice the length of the Greendale rupture. So 30 kilometre long fault rupture, 60 kilometre sort of influence, if you like, zone of influence. Mm -hmm. So that extends from somewhere near the coast to well into the Canterbury foothills, but, but not right across the South Island. Mm -hmm. And now we're in that period of time where those stresses are progressively going to be, um, if you like, relieved. And the relieving process involves continuing aftershock or earthquake activity. Now, of course, during that period, post 4th of September, we've had a number of other larger earthquakes which have been, in a sense, triggered inside that zone of, of stressed rock. Mm. And they, in turn, have stressed another volume of rock around them. And so now that zone has extended a bit. But as we look forward over the next, say, two to three decades, progressively, the earthquake activity will deal with that stress change. It will start to relieve it. And if you come back in a few years' time, you'll, you'll get the occasional sort of magnitude 4 and magnitude 3. You'll get more magnitude 2s. Well, mostly we don't even notice those. And so certainly it's, it's something we can live with. Yep. So for, so. For, for us, again, I suppose as a community, I think what I'm hearing, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, what I'm hearing is that there is a natural decay sequences. Yes, That's yes. not unexpected. It, yes. it doesn't mean that something is building up. In fact, it means the reverse is true. Mm -hmm. And that the, the number of those that we notice is such that in even a few years' time, the vast majority of expectation is you wouldn't feel this stuff. But it's just going on somewhere. Absolutely, that's, that's yeah. right. A yep. fading away, a fading away sort of uh, behaviour. We've noticed actually the, the big earthquake in Fiordland um, in 2009 there was a magnitude 4.9 aftershock on that uh, just a couple of days ago, or yesterday or the day before. So that's the sort of thing that we... It, but that was a magnitude 7.8. Mm. That was a very big earthquake. So three years later, there's this isolated magnitude 4. Mm. Uh, now, if we scale that down, maybe that a few years later, you might well have some magnitude 3s still um, well, again, around the region. 
I mean, I got to say, I find that that's reassuring again mm -hmm. to hear that. So that's the expectation. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so why did this happen to okay. us? Because, you know, I'm, I, I'm uh, have been around local government for a couple of decades, involved in, mm -hmm. in civil defence. I can say we were never expecting, in my view, a seismic event of this size, this close. It mm -hmm. was always liable to be movement on the main fault lines deep in the Southern Alps and Angahu mm. emerges mm. in places yeah. like this. Why did it happen mm. here? Well, we are on a plate boundary and the plate boundary has width a zone, if you like, in which there is activity. So, and the activity is expressed by earthquakes. And um, we've always known that there are, not, there's not just the Alpine Fault, but there are many faults in that zone of the plate boundary. It's, it extends uh, right across the South Island and in the eastern part of the South Island, so Canterbury coastal region extending right out to offshore here, um, we're sort of on the fringe of that plate boundary zone. Now the faults that are close to the Alpine Fault and, and, and the main sort of axial part of the island, if you like, the mountain belt, those are much more active. They have earthquakes, much larger earthquakes, much more frequently um, of the order of hundreds of years apart. Then as you go towards the east, the rate of tectonic or geologic activity on the faults is much less. Um, so the, the Greendale Fault, for example, has an activity rate of, of or a, a rate of slip on it, which is about one hundredth of what the Alpine Fault is. But every now and then you are going to have to accommodate an earthquake on, on even those faults right out on the fringe out to the east to accommodate the strains, the distortions that are going on across that plate boundary. And in that sense, you know, it's unfortunate it's happened in our time. Mm -hmm. um, we're talking about faults that rupture only every few thousand or even 10,000 years apart. Um, but, but really, it's not unexpected in the context of the geologic setting. Um, the bit that we had less of a handle on, of course, was just what the fault structure under the Canterbury Plains looks like. Mm. I mean, that's the bit that was hard. We can see at the north end of the Canterbury Plains there are a few of these faults just showing up at the ground surface, just starting to poke their nose up above the surface. But by the time you come level with Christchurch and further south, all this stuff is hidden beneath the plains. And some of those faults have been active. Some of them have not been active. And um, so the Greendale Fault, in that sense, we didn't know about it, but it's not a great surprise. We did always anticipate uh, earthquakes up to sort of magnitude 7 beneath the Canterbury Plains, anywhere beneath the plains, including beneath, beneath the sort of area around Christchurch. But of course it's happened on our watch. Mm. What about, are there any other areas that are closer to the province, I suppose? You've, you've touched on the main mm. divide and the main fault mm. line down there. I mean, people are also aware, and you've touched on Yargon, North Canterbury. Further mm. afield, Kelvin, are there other um, places in the South Island that might be the The, the thing to look back to um, is the sequence in the, in the Buller Northwest Nelson region that started off with a really big earthquake in Murchison in 1929. Mm. Uh, that was a magnitude 7.8. That was had an extended period of activity in Northwest Nelson for a long time. Now, actually, from a geological or a very long-term average point of view, Buller and Northwest Nelson should look like Central Otago in terms of its activity rates of earthquakes. But in the last hundred, e well, since 1929, the Buller region's been really quite active. So that's uh, another perhaps example of how, in the long term, things do switch around, and even in these. Uh, regions which are not really part of the main axial belt of um, earthquakes and volcanoes through New Zealand, they still do have to have earthquakes at some stage. So it sort of is a wrong, unlucky wrong place, wrong time. Um, having said that, there have been part of this is a perception problem as well, and that the, that Christchurch would have residents would have experienced quite a few earthquakes at the early settlement days. There was the local earthquakes in 1869 and 1870, which weren't, they were probably below magnitude six, but 1869 and 1870, and then the city was struck a number of times, 1888 and 1904 um, come to mind, so, and 1922. But of course they're almost, well, 100 years or so ago, and they really are out of the consciousness of um, Canterbury um, thinking. Okay. 
The Alpine Fault, I mean, that's the biggie for us, isn't mm -hmm. it? And you touched, I think, Yarg, on the, the way I think about the way they move is the Alpine Fault's moving, what, 35 mils, 40 mils? 20, 20, 20, 25 to 30. 30. Yeah. So a significant mm -hmm. amount of movement mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, you know, that's, that's that much on, movement on in a year. every year, yeah. yes. <laughs> but out here on the plains, they're, they're moving, compared to that, a minuscule, a minuscule half a mil or something like that. So yes. I get the feeling that it's like a spring that is being tensioned in the mm -hmm. Southern Alps, that spring is being tensioned at a rate mm -hmm. which is many, many, many times in excess of mm. the sort of faults that we have out here with that just being tensioned a tiny amount. Tiny. Hence, it's going to be a long time before they have built up enough energy. Before from... they recharge or in yeah. some sense of the word. Okay, yeah. so what about the, what about the, mm. uh, the big main so divide, main fault? That, is that one that's building up that we should be thinking oh. around? certainly need to be thinking around and there's quite a lot of work goes on on the Alpine Fault. Mm -hmm. um, it has, it's not, um, it's been talked of as being overdue or um, you know it's going to happen in you know very short order. Um, more recent work has shown at now that maybe it's a, average is around about 320 years but there's a big variability, big uncertainty or big variability on that. It can be as short as 100 and it can be as long as 500. And that means that the 320, it doesn't work like clockwork. And so there's a chance, uh, so the, the, the numbers that come from that, 30% chance in the next 50 years. It's only you know, a one in three chance within, the, within another gen, two generations or a generation and a half. Um, it will be a big earthquake. The past the evidence suggests they're close to magnitude 8, but it's 100 kilometres from Christchurch. It's a different story for Milford Sound and Franz Joseph and places like that, of course. Um, but it's not overdue and it's not a guarantee that it's there, but it needs to be in the planning. It needs to be in all sorts of planning, like in the building code and future land use development in, in, in Christchurch and throughout the South Island. But we have time. We have time, almost certainly. You know, I think one of the great things is that we come out of this with, with so much learning. Mm -hmm. And one of our goals is to make sure that we build the safest city yes. in the world. Mm -hmm. and are you confident that, that the learnings that we have got out of the last 15 or 16 months will lay a platform for us to be able to claim those sorts of things, to build a truly safe city? I think we are. I mean, I think we've learned so much and we're still learning, which is good. And that's part of uh, the, the lessons learned are, are really critical for us at this point. I think it's also worth really making the comment that this isn't just a lesson for Christchurch or Canterbury. This is a lesson for the whole of New Zealand. It's a lesson. There are aspects of this earthquake sequence that will also improve globally mm -hmm. uh, the earthquake engineering practice and also the way that the geosciences are able to, to, to deal with uh, events when they happen and, and how we study and how we extract relevant information as quickly and effectively as possible. I mean, it is, it is a challenge for us as scientists to communicate the complexities of the subject. And one of the comments I, I was going to make earlier is there is actually a lot of the information that we're gathering and, and processing is available through Google, it's, you know, through Geonet. Um, we're not we're not covering things up. We've got it all out there. Because there people have suggested, yeah, haven't they? I mean, there was a, and one of the reasons I called that, that media mm -hmm. conference the other day was yeah, right. that mm -hmm. I began to hear voices in the community saying, mm -hmm. you guys are not telling us yeah. mm -hmm. everything. You know right. something about something. Right. It was even a rumour about some chunk of some fault in the North Island falling into a trench and it was yeah. being hushed up. I mean, you know, yeah. are you covering anything up? Is there something that Absolutely we should not. know? No. There's a lot of things we don't know, no. <laughs> <laughs> but, there's, but there's nothing that's being covered up yeah. once we have discovered it. Yeah. Of course, it takes time to process the information, yeah. and it's important to put good information out there, not not the hundred percent level, not the absolute truth, but it's but it's getting out there quite early, and it's these days with Google. Googling any sort of uh, thing geological, uh, it, it, you're, there's a lot of material that does come up. Mm. In relation to lessons learned, going mm. to that point, I think mm. the other thing that is happening here in Christchurch and in Canterbury is the connectedness between different professions. And I think that's the key thing that will build the city back better, it will learn all the lessons, it will make planning around things like the future Alpine Fault earthquake is that scientists are talking to engineers, to city planners, to, to the politicians. I mean, 
scientists are talking to people in Treasury. Mm. I mean, these are the, the, the Christchurch earthquake has brought together a very much a whole of New Zealand um, response mm. to this, and that augurs well for, for, for Christchurch, but also for the rest of the country. Mm. We, we had the platform in place, which I think is worth mentioning. You know, the, um, has its research platform has really served us well because it meant we had an immediate and coordinated starting point. Otherwise, we'd have been a whole group of different organisations trying to fall over each other, and it was coordinated um, with with Kelvin in charge of the, the platform. We, it was coordinated from the word go, and it was a far more effective response. And we needed to be effective at that. On the fourth of September, there was no time to start planning at that stage. Mm. So. Well, um, can, you, can you tell us, I guess, a fitting question to end on in a way, is, you know, <laughs> is this thing ever going to end? I mean, <laughs> we thought after so, the 4th of September that, yeah, you know, it was all going to be over by Christmas mm. and uh, right. here we are 15 months later and there's still stuff at night that'll wake us up and, mm -hmm. you know, cause yeah. the dog to bark and the mm. cat to bury its head underneath right. the pillow. And yeah. So what's happening, guys? Are we? Well, I think it, it will end. There's no question about that. But it's it's not um, something that will end just one day, and you can just draw the line on it. it. It dissipates progressively, as we were talking about before. I think at this stage, what we are seeing, and it's been consistent all the way through, is a migration of the activity progressively to the east, and it's now migrated offshore. And I think it will continue to to disperse into a network of faults out there and uh, we will progressively uh, see a lessening of the activity over time. That doesn't mean to say we won't get a, another few uh, significant shakes in the, in the uh, sort of immediate period, but um, it won't go on forever. Mm. Well, I've got to say a, lot been, of, sorry, a lot Kelvin. of energy released in the city area as well, and, yeah. and really the energy just can't be built up again quickly enough mm. to mm. break again in any sort of likely return period. So. The, 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 city's had, the city's had its big earthquake, I think. Mm. Um, and that's an important point to remember for our future, I think. You mm. know, one of, one of the reasons that I feel so optimistic and so bullish about our future is not only have we learned a huge amount, and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we've all lost some beautiful souls in this city and we never want that to happen again. Mm. But we've got the, the skills, we've now got more knowledge than probably just about any other place. Mm -hmm on the planet, but uh, maybe somewhere like California, about what is going on directly under us. Mm -hmm. And you guys are painting for me, I think, a, a positive fi a picture, a true picture, mm -hmm. but a positive picture that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we've got a great future from mm -hmm. what we've learned. Yeah. So I want to thank you both very much. I've got to say, I've, it's been a privilege working alongside you guys throughout this process. And let's hope we don't have to work together for too <laughs> much too longer. Much longer. Yes. <laughs> so uh, right. there it is. Pleasure. Thank you. We, we can never really, uh, predict earthquakes, we need to be honest about that. But we hope that this discussion about the ongoing seismic activity in our city has been informative and helpful, uh, and I hope that you find it, as I do, uh, reassuring as well. The program is going to be available on the uh, Sarah website, and uh, I imagine a few other people will spread it around a few other uh, websites as well. It contains some good information. So get your family and friends to uh, watch it. Knowledge, I think, in a situation like this helps us all to understand the uh, reality of uh, what we're in. Don't get complacent though. Remember to keep that uh, emergency uh, kit and a bit of spare water standing by and a few supplies. Let's think that way and take care.